Thank you, team. Would you bow with me and let's pray. Oh, Father, how we long for that day when our faith shall be sight, when we would, together with all the saints, redeemed through all of the ages, gather around your throne and sing at the top of our lungs, all hail, Redeemer, hail, for you have died for me. And oh Lord, how we long that your kingdom would be established on this earth. Oh, Father, as your son taught us to pray, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And we pray, Father, that you would let the gospel go forth with power in this day and age where it seems on so many sides the enemy is advancing and your kingdom is retreating. May we see it as it truly is that you are building your church and that your kingdom is advancing. Lord, reach more. Use us and reach more with the good news that there is a Savior and that every kingdom will bow before our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's our great desire now to know you more through your word. So as we gather around this, your living and active word, Father, we recognize that we need to bring nothing to it. It is complete. It is alive. So Lord, would you help us to understand your living and active word and what it means for us this day. To that end, I pray that you would send your spirit and power, that you would give your words to these lips of mine, that the words spoken would faithfully expound and explain your word, not adding to, not subtracting from, not in the power of a man alone, but by your spirit's power, would you teach us from your word. Lord, give us hearts and minds that respond. Give us soft and supple hearts. Help us to bear a fruit of righteousness and holy joy because of what you do in us through your living and active word. Have your way in the time ahead, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn in them to the first book of Kings in the Old Testament, this monumental Old Testament book. And particularly in these, in these weeks that we're in right now, we're dealing sort of as a mini-series within the book of Kings. We're dealing with the life of Elijah Last week we left off at the end of chapter 18. This week we pick up on the first 18 verses of chapter 19. So if you turn to chapter 18, we're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to back it up just a bit to give you the context. And then we're going to journey through the first 18 verses of chapter 19. We'll journey through them as we go. But let's pick up the story at 1 Kings 18 and verse 38. And I'll read to the end of the chapter. 1 Kings 18 starting at verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again, seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab 
to the entrance of Jezreel. This is the word of the Lord. May he add his blessing to the reading of it. So we ended chapter 18 last week with Elijah really flying high spiritually. And why wouldn't he? I mean, this is the man who single-handedly took on the entire establishment of the nation of Israel. He single-handedly faced down the new government-approved national religion of Baal worship in Israel. It really was the ultimate rumble in the jungle before the time of Muhammad Ali or George Foreman. Elijah rented the MGM Grand of his day for his title fight, challenging 450 of the prophets of Baal in front of a massive crowd of interested onlookers. And at the end of that time on Mount Carmel, he proved that once and for all, there could be no doubt The God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the Exodus, the conquest, David, that God is the true and the living God, and anybody else is an imposter. After that task was done, remember, he prays for rain, and he perseveres in prayer for rain. It doesn't happen right away, but eventually it does. And after three and a half years of absolutely zero rain from the sky. Over three and a half years of absolute barrenness, Elijah prays and the Lord answers with rain. So heaven's fire has fallen. The people have fallen to their faces in worship of God. And now the rain has fallen to save the lives of the needy citizens of Israel. So talk about a mountaintop experience. It doesn't get any better than this. Elijah could actually die this moment and be stamped on his gravestone. Life mission accomplished. He's done it all. And yet you and I know because we've lived longer than five minutes You and I know that life isn't lived always on the mountain peak of delight and happiness. Dads, you get this especially. I think of you on this Father's Day. I think of us. One minute, we're on the mountaintop of delight. And the next minute, not so much. Maybe one minute, you're having one of those spiritual discussions with your child about life, about Jesus Christ, about the difference it makes to belong to Jesus Christ by faith and live your life seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, how it's changed your life to be saved and how you want more than anything for your child to know the joy of being saved by Jesus Christ. It's one of those serendipitous discussions that you can't plan for, you long to have always, but you know you can't force it because every time you try to force a conversation about spiritual things with your kid, you know as soon as you start, the eyes glaze over and the mind goes far, far away. So this time, the the Lord has opened the doorway. Your kid's listening. In fact, not only is he listening, he's interacting. He's asking questions. He's making statements about his goals in life and how he wants to follow the Lord too. You're on the mountaintop. Baptism comes up and you are excited beyond belief. So to go to celebrate, you say, let's go have ice cream. And on your drive to the ice cream parlor, you get cut off in traffic. You lose your cool. You lose your temper. And all the fruit of that discussion is gone. You're in the valley. You've left the mountaintop. Well, today's text in chapter 19 deals with life when you move from the mountaintop down to the valley. Today's text in chapter 19 actually begins at the royal palace in Jezreel. As we saw at the end of chapter 18, Elijah has run ahead of the king's chariot all the way in the pouring rain from Mount Carmel to the gate of this royal city. And now as they get to the city, Elijah waits outside while Ahab goes inside to tell his wife, the queen, everything that has just happened on Carmel. Now when we're dealing with chapter 18, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but In chapter 18, there was a deafening omission. 
If you go back early in the chapter to when Elijah lays down the challenge for the battle of the gods, in verse 19 of chapter 18, it tells us Elijah invited all of Israel to the showdown, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, that's Baal's female consort, as well as the queen. Well, you'd obviously expect the queen is going to be there. If the king is going to be there, the queen will be at his side. That's how royal functions work. But Jezebel isn't there. The prophets of Asherah who eat at her table, they're not there either. So Ahab gets back to Jezreel, and verse 1 of chapter 19 tells us, take a look at verse 1, Ahab told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And I'm sure he told her more than that as well. I'm sure that Ahab the king paints for his wife a picture of everything that just happened on the mountaintop. He would tell her of Baal's deafening silence when his prophets pleaded with him for help and to answer their prayers. He would have told her of their pathetic hobbling around their own altar, praying desperately for hour after hour, even getting to the point of gashing themselves until the blood flowed, all in the vain attempt to get the attention of their distant deity. And then he would have told Jezebel of Elijah. And this miraculous fire that came down from heaven when Elijah raised his simple prayer to the God of Israel, how this all-consuming fire comes down like a laser beam to lick up the sacrifice, even to lick up the water in the ditch around the altar. And I'm sure Ahab would have obviously told his wife how all the people gathered on the mountain see all of this, see the answered prayer, recognize who truly lives in heaven, and all of them as one fall on their faces with the cry, the Lord, Yahweh, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And I'm sure Ahab explains, as the text tells us, that None of the 450 prophets of Baal, none of them are going to be home for dinner tonight. Actually, they're not ever going to be back for dinner because Elijah slaughtered them all at the Kidron River. But while all of this is going on inside the palace, Elijah's waiting outside. We don't know exactly where he is, but while the king is debriefing with the queen, we know Elijah isn't far. He's waiting. He's waiting for a report on what happened as a result of the discussion. He's waiting for some kind of news, and he waits, and he waits, and he waits. And I wonder what he's hoping to hear, don't you? I mean, maybe he's hoping to hear that the queen has been convinced by the obvious emptiness of Baal and the demonstrated power of God. Maybe he's hoping that she will be convinced and respond to Ahab's report by saying, well, I must be wrong three and a half years of no rain while we depend on Baal for fertility, and then a single prayer prayed to the God of Israel, prayed by one solitary prophet, and the heavens open up and the fruit comes out. Well, clearly, I need to join in the pledging of allegiance to the one true God, one nation under God. And so let me join the worship choir. Let me add my voice. The Lord, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Maybe that's what Elijah was hoping for. And if the conversion of Jezebel may be a little bit of a stretch to hope for, Elijah would surely at least hope that King Ahab's going to grow a spine. I mean, Jezebel's the one who's pushed Baal worship as the official replacement religion in the nation. Maybe Ahab will finally stand up and say, enough, enough is enough, I'm cleaning house. There will be no more worship of that false god in my kingdom. So at least if Jezebel isn't converted, at least she would be restrained and defanged. At least the rebuilding of the nation under God can begin in earnest. The text tells us it doesn't work out quite that way at all. In fact, verse 2 gives us the queen's response. Let's take a look. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, 
so may the gods do to me. And more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time this morning. So Jezebel hears the good news of God's miraculous provision on Mount Carmel. She sees through the palace window, even as she's in discussion with her husband, she can see the rain falling on the fields, bringing life back to the land after three and a half years of absolute drought and barrenness. And not only does none of this bring Jezebel to her knees in worship and thanksgiving, I mean, she's a queen. Aren't you supposed to care about your people when you're royalty over the nation? Shouldn't she be thankful that her people are now going to be able to eat? No, none of that for her. In fact, Ahab's report does the opposite of bring her thankfulness. It infuriates her. She sends a messenger outside to find Elijah and to vent her rage on this man who has dared to shake up the status quo in which she has been so comfortable. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. I swear on my grandmother's grave that within 24 hours, Elijah, your life is going to be exactly like one of the 450 lives of the prophets that you have killed. In fact, notice in verse 2, she doesn't even swear by God, the God. She swears by the gods, plural. So she hasn't even budged. Not a bit. And we already know by the story of Jezebel earlier in chapter 18 that she is ruthless and powerful enough that if she threatens to kill a prophet of the Lord, she intends to do it and she has the means to do so. She's already rounded up hundreds of God's prophets and sent them to the firing squad. So imagine being Elijah at this moment. Well, that's clearly not the response I was hoping for. You think he would respond something like that? So let this be a lesson to everyone who thinks, you know what, we need more people to be saved. We need more people to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what we need in order to see more people saved what we need are some more mighty works of power. We need miracles in our evangelism. If only, if only I could perform a miraculous healing in Jesus' name. If the doubters around me could see a visible healing, a miracle that they can't deny, fire falling from the sky, then they wouldn't doubt anymore. Yeah, but yes, they would. Yes, they would. Then they would have to believe if they saw a miracle from heaven, if they saw somebody healed before their eyes, if they saw a mighty deed of Jesus Christ, then they would have to believe. But no, they wouldn't. Jezebel has seen it. She sees the rain falling around her. Miracles meant nothing to Jezebel, and she wants Elijah dead. Elijah knows how serious this threat is. So he responds, verses 3 and 4, take a look with me. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's dirt journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. Let's stop there. So Elijah runs for his life. Beersheba is at the very southern tip of the southern kingdom of Judah. In case you're not clear on locations, Elijah is in the northern kingdom of Israel. So this trip from where he's at in Jezreel to Beersheba in the south, that's a trip of over 100 miles on foot. He drops his servant off in Beersheba. He's not done, but he says, I'm not going to need you anymore because I'm quitting the ministry once and for all. And then he goes another day's journey into the wilderness, finds the shade of a broom tree to rest underneath. And here, under this lonely shelter, Elijah makes a prayer. Let's pick up the text in verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. 
And he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. What's going on here? Well, you know that something's not right here in the story. We know that something's not right with Elijah. I mean, why does this man go on this marathon run in the first place? <laughs> he goes because Jezebel swore to kill him. He's running for his life. The Bible text tells us that. So if he's running to save his life, why does he get to the end of his journey where he is finally safe from Jezebel's clutches? Why does he get to the end of his run to save his life and then his prayer to God is, please take my life? doesn't make sense. Something's wrong here. But one commentator points out that Elijah wants to die because he's broken. He didn't want to die at Jezebel's hand because that would be considered a victory for her. She would brag about adding one more star to her shoulder patch of dead prophets of the Lord. So that's why he ran, to get away from her. But at this very southern border of the southern kingdom, Elijah is way out of the queen's reach. She's not going to get credit for his death. So here, Elijah begs that the Lord would take his life. No matter how exactly you interpret this, one thing you can be sure of is that Elijah's not in a good place here. And you can't miss the contrast here, can you, between Elijah on Mount Carmel and Elijah under the broom tree in the wilderness? He's gone from the highest of heights, literally and figuratively speaking, to the lowest of lows. So what do you make of Elijah here? One of the things I was struck on by as I was studying it this past week is how many commentators go to town on Elijah here? How they rip him apart after just expounding on his great faith on the top of the mountain. Now he gets to this valley and they start to roll up their sleeves and pummel him. One commentator exclaims, what a contrast. Elijah the hero on Carmel, victorious over Baalism. Elijah the coward of unbelief at Horeb, self-occupied, utterly discouraged, wishing to die, praying against rather than for God's people. So Elijah, a hero, goes to Elijah, a coward of unbelief. Another commentator puts it this way. The panic that came over him when Jezebel issued her threat against his life has punctured his inflated image of himself. So Elijah the egomaniac, Jezebel gives her threat and suddenly his pride is punctured. Another commentator pronounces his judgment on Elijah. On Mount Horeb, which is where he's headed now, we see him weak, mistaken, and in need of God's rebuke. God's opening question shows that although God's messenger had enabled Elijah to make the journey, Elijah should not have really been there. Elijah's answer completely devalued what had happened on Mount Carmel. So Elijah, weak and needing a spanking from God. Hmm. I wonder what you think as you read this text. I wonder how, how do you judge Elijah, this man of faith, in this chapter of his life. I mean, I hope at least you can understand how he would be feeling rather low right now. I mean, this man has done everything he could possibly do to get his nation back on track. He didn't run away from it. He went to it in its rebellion. He rents the giant stadium. He walks to center stage. He stands alone against the entire power structure of the nation. And right on cue, he produces by God's answer to his prayer the most astounding, spectacular, miracle show that anyone has ever seen. And it all seems to work. The people were worshiping. They're on their faces, worshiping the true God of heaven. Again, the king himself seems to be on board. But now this angry reaction of the stubborn queen, and boy, does this queen ever seem to be wearing the royal trousers in this family, don't you think? 
Jezebel says no to God, and everyone else caves. They fold up their tent. There's no pushback from Ahab. There's no mass protest in the street. There are no marchers with their picket signs, placards saying, Elijah's life matters as they protest down the street. They're not saying, we want the real God back. There's nothing, nothing. So how would you react if you were Elijah here? Now, I'm old enough and I've talked to enough people in the course of my life and ministry that I'm pretty confident that even in a group this size and those watching online right now, that there is at least someone in this audience who has had thoughts in the not-too-distant past, thoughts that you would prefer death rather than life because this life is too painful. Let me point out, if that's something that you've been wrestling with, let me point out that Elijah, even in this state of utter despair, doesn't presume that he has the right to take his own life. Suicide, friends, is the ultimate act of selfishness. It is not an answer. It may seem to remove the pain for an instant for you, which you have an eternity to look forward to of judgment under God's hand when you reject him, not to mention the, the pain you cause those that are left behind to mourn. It's the height of rebellion against a God who has given you life itself and numbered your days and promised that he is working out your good plan in your life no matter how painful today seems to be. But Elijah does want to die. He's not going to commit suicide, but he, he wants to die, and he explains why. In verse 10, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. So is Elijah wrong in his understanding of his current situation? Well, he's absolutely right about his own faith. He's standing apparently alone. He's right about his people. They seem intent on turning away from God and to false gods who can give them nothing. He's right about their failure to worship, and it's no mere rumor about what Jezebel did to her prophets that she intends to kill him and will likely do it if not for God's intervention. So, so what do you do with the, someone like Elijah who's in a state of spiritual despair and there is at least a grain of truth to their concerns about the world that they're living in? What do you do with someone who you care about who's in a state of spiritual despair. Well, what does God do? We'll get to that in a minute because I can't think of a subject more relevant to us this day on the tail end of this COVID that has knocked us all off of our routine for a year. Some of you are going through times of uncertainty as to your own health your own future. Others see relationships fragmenting and breaking apart in your hands. Some of you have lost loved ones or are on the verge of losing loved ones. You look around at a world that seems to be intent on running further and further away from the good news of Jesus Christ. You're discouraged you're in despair. You don't know how to respond. You don't know what to think of this state. Hear me, friend, when I say this, that a person who belongs to God through Jesus Christ, a Christian, can find himself in a state of spiritual despair, depression. That may seem obvious to some of you because you've been there. You say, I know that. What do you think I'm living through right now? You know that Christians can be in a place of despair. But there are some people, and this is why I say it, there are some people who say no Christian should ever be depressed. Not ever. 
And if that's what you've been taught, if that's what you think, I would respond to that assertion by saying this. Well, it depends on what you mean by no Christian should ever be depressed. If you mean by that that it's not God's intention for his children to be joyless, if you mean that spiritual depression is a warning light and when it starts flashing before your eyes, you better wake up, you better take care of some business because you're heading off course, if that's what you mean when you say no Christian should ever be depressed, then I would say a hearty amen to that concern. But if you mean that any time a Christian ever wakes up in a place of despair in this sin-scarred world, any time they feel themselves in a place of spiritual depression, if you mean that then they are sinning, rebelling against God, because real Christians don't get depressed. The joy of the Lord is my strength, the Bible says. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. If you say a Christian, by being in a place of spiritual depression, is automatically in a place of sin, if that's what you say, then I would say to you, I think you should look at history. Look at Charles Spurgeon, for example. We talked about him last week, the famous 19th century London preacher. Preached to a church of thousands. Last week I told you about him taking the group of college students downstairs to see the furnace room of his church where hundreds of people down there were praying for the service of thousands that were about to gather upstairs. This man who spoke to thousands and impacted so many lives. For Charles Spurgeon... Depression wasn't just a theory. He lived it. He spoke of it many times in his sermons and lectures, and often in the examples he gave weren't other people. They were examples of his own life. In one sermon he said, you may be surrounded with all the comforts of life and yet be in wretchedness more gloomy than death if the spirits are depressed. You may have no outward cause whatever for sorrow, and yet if the mind is dejected, the brightest sunshine will not relieve your gloom. There are times when all our evidences get clouded and all our joys are fled. Though we may still cling to the cross, yet it is with a desperate grip. You know what that is, friend, to cling to the cross out of desperation. No outward cause that you can point to for your sorrow, and yet your mind is dejected and the brightest sun doesn't relieve your gloom. He understood, Spurgeon did, that the spiritual depression, it's not always logical. Cause is not always clear. There are times, he said, when our spirits betray us and we sink into darkness. We slip into the bottomless pits where our souls can bleed in 10,000 ways and die over and over again each hour. You been there? Feels like every hour that goes by, you die again. There's no reasoning. A remedy is hard to find. He put it once to a lecture to his students. You may as well fight with the mist as with this shapeless, undefinable, yet all beclouding hopelessness. One affords himself no pity when in this case, because it seems to be unreasonable and even sinful to be troubled without manifest cause, and yet troubled the man is, even in the very depths of his spirit. It needs a heavenly hand to push it back, but nothing short of this will chase away the nightmare of soul. Charles Spurgeon spoke to thousands, loved the Lord, and yet knew spiritual depression. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a little closer to our own time, wrote an entire book titled it Spiritual Depression, and he wrote in that book, it's interesting to notice the frequency with which this particular theme is dealt with in the scriptures, and the only conclusion to be drawn from it is that it is a very common condition. It seems to be a condition which has afflicted God's people right from the beginning, for you, describe, you find it described and dealt with in the Old Testament and in the New. So look at history, friend. Can a Christian be 
depressed. Look at history. But more than that, look at our one unerring, infallible source of authority. Look at the Bible. What does the Bible say about it? How does God deal with it? So what does God do with a, an Elijah, a man of faith who's now broken? Well, what Elijah does is sends a messenger. Let's pick it up in verse 5. Elijah lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. So Elijah sends an angel, literally a messenger. If Jezebel is going to send a messenger to tell Elijah that she's going to kill him, then God's going to send a messenger of his own to his child. And what does the messenger from God do? What does he say? When he gets to Elijah sleeping there in his depression, does the angel say, snap out of it, man? God says, rejoice always in everything, give thanks. No, the angel doesn't say that. Does he say, man, you better get your eyes off yourself. Your ego is too big. You're all wrapped up in yourself. Come on, man. Give your head a shake. No, the angel doesn't say that either. In fact, don't miss the very first thing that God's angel does for Elijah in his depression. The very first thing the angel does, verse 5, he cooks. He cooks him a meal. Verse 5, behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. Not exactly the therapy that probably most of us would have given. Man, for Elijah's sake, aren't you glad that the first ones to visit him and to function as his therapist weren't you and me? How many of us, when we come across a, a depressed Christian that we care about, our first instinct, our, our knee-jerk reaction is to reach into the pocket and pull out a spiritual checklist of dealing with depression? And then we start to go down the list. Okay, Elijah, you're depressed. There's got to be a reason for this. I'm going to fix you. Here we go. Let's go down the checklist. Have you, have you prayed for relief? Okay, have you, have you confessed every known sin? Have you, have you pleaded the blood? Have you claimed the promises? Have you rebuked the devil? Have you thanked God enough? And on and on and on down the list we go. What does God do? God makes him a meal and tells him to eat. That's a great reminder, friend. A great reminder that Elijah, like you and me, is a physical being living in a physical world with physical weaknesses and sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do when you're in Elijah's state of depression is not listen to another sermon. It's always a good thing to do that, but sometimes that's not the cure. It's not necessarily the cure to spend another night awake on your knees fasting and praying for deliverance. Sometimes it is, but sometimes the most spiritual thing that you or I could do to deal with our depression is to eat and get some protein in your body and have a good night's sleep. Elijah receives God's food and sleeps. And then in verse 7, the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. You see the tender compassion of God on display here, friend? He's feeding his servant, but not just feeding. He's also sending his messenger. And then he sends his messenger who in turn reaches out his hand. You see the picture there? reaches out his hand, gently awakens the sleeping believer, broken as he is, so he can get up, get more of the nutrition his physical body needs. And that's what he does. Elijah gets up, 
He eats, he drinks, and he heads out further on his journey. He penetrates deeper south, going further and further for 40 days and 40 nights, the text tells us, until he comes to almost what is the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula, which is now present-day Egypt. And at this point in his journey, Elijah is now 200 miles south of Beersheba. That's where he dropped off his servant, remember that, which was already 100 miles south of his home in the royal palace back at Jezreel. So Elijah at this point in his life is as far separated from Jezebel as you can go without getting your feet wet in the Red Sea to the south. There is no way Jezebel can get him here. Text tells us he ends up at Mount Horeb where he finds a cave in the towering rocky peaks of what is modern day Mount Catherine and he sets up camp inside the cave. So the first thing God does for his weary warrior is to cook for him, give him a meal. Second thing God does for Elijah is to listen. Take a look at verse nine. There he came to a cave and lodged in it, that's Elijah, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? Remember who's speaking here. This is the God of the universe who sees the end from the beginning and everything in between. He's not needing information from his servant like I am when I keep losing my keys. Where are my keys, I ask everyone. God's not asking the question like that. God is inviting his servant to share his heart. And that's exactly what Elijah does. He shares the burden on his soul. Everyone has abandoned you except for me. They've destroyed your worship. They've torn down your altars. And I'm the last man standing in faith. God's listening to his servant. Hear that, Christian. Sometimes when people ask me about prayer, their concerns are, well, um, what should I ask God for? And... How should I come up with things to thank him for or praise him for? As if prayer must be melted down to this list of things that we take to God in request or thanksgiving. Sometimes prayer is sharing with God your heart. Take a look at the book of Psalms. It's filled with God's inspired writers pouring out their hearts to God, the good, the bad, and the ugly. If it's in their heart, they take it to God's throne of grace. There's no better place to take it. And this text reminds us that God wants to hear your heart. And if Elijah was living in sin by being depressed right now, rather than living in faith, then don't you think that once Elijah bears his heart, this would be the perfect time for God to tell him off and set him straight. Come on, man, give your head a shake. But again, God doesn't do what many people think he should. Instead, what does he do? He tells Elijah to step out of the cave. Verse 11, and he said, go out. And stand on the mount before the Lord. So Elijah steps out. God says, stand there. Just stand. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. Just just stand there. And in verses 11 and 12, give us the third thing that God does for his depressed servant. He cooks for him. He listens to him. And this description of the third thing is one of the most powerful, most vivid descriptions of God in all of the Bible. Verse 11, let's pick it up at the beginning again. And he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound 
of a low whisper. See here the God of the universe condescending to the side of a mountain in the middle of nowhere to reveal himself to his weary spiritual warrior. This is the third thing God does for Elijah. Feeds him, listens to him, and now he reveals his presence to his weary warrior. And before we get into God's revealing of himself and and the description of it, I wonder if you're wondering about this journey of Elijah. Like 40 days and 40 nights into the wilderness, and this Mount Horeb, why? Is there, any, is there any meaning to this? Or is this just random wanderings of a depressed man? Well, I hope you're asking these questions because there is meaning and it's important. And to help you see how the meaning ties together here, I want you to think back centuries before Elijah's day. For Elijah, this is ancient history. But can you think back in Elijah's history of a time when the number 40 and the wilderness would go together? Put your thinking caps on and go back in your mind's time machine. Back centuries and centuries before Elijah. I think Exodus. In fact, Maybe this will give you the hint that you need. This very Mount Horeb that Elijah is on right now, it also goes by another name. It's also known as Mount Sinai. You see how this connects now. When God led his people to freedom out of slavery, he rescued them when they had nothing. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. Oh, there's that number 40 in this wilderness. And on that journey, Moses, their leader, leads them to this very mountain to meet with God. They are at the base of Mount Sinai, camped out. God is going to take them from a rabble group of freed slaves, one massive extended family, and he's going to turn them into a nation, his holy nation. The people are camped out at the base of this very mountain and Moses himself goes up the mountain into a cave and he spends 40 days and 40 nights in that cave on this mountain with God preparing to lead Israel into a covenant relationship with the holy God of heaven. Now do you see the connection And see what that means for Elijah. He has run hundreds of miles on foot to this very place. Perhaps he is right now in the very cave that Moses was in when the Lord revealed himself back then. So you see what's happening in Elijah's life. This covenant people have failed so radically. They've turned away from God's covenant. Elijah runs not just randomly to get as far away from home as he can in his depression to be alone. Elijah runs with a purpose. He runs back here to the very mountain where it all started and the covenant was made where God promised to be Israel's God and they promised in turn to be his holy people. The rest have all turned away, but Elijah needs him now more than ever. And you've been there, Christian. In your spiritual despair, you you feel like you're all alone in this world. There's nobody you can depend on to walk with you on this spiritual journey. And you look around you and you see a world falling apart. What do you do? That's where Elijah is. He runs to the Lord. He runs as far back to where it all started so he can be with the Lord again. And now he's here. And I want you to picture this scene in your mind's eye. Here he is inside the cave's opening, tucked into the side of this rugged mountain. And you know that being at this height, the breeze is brisk, the wind is whistling past the open doorway. And Elijah is paying attention like he has never paid attention to anything before. And wouldn't you? I mean, the Lord, the God of heaven, is about to pass by his presence in your presence. You are captivated. And then the wind starts to pick up. 
and it begins to blow with increasing force and it starts to pound the mountain and you can hear the wind and it's not whistling anymore, now it's howling and then it gets stronger and stronger until it is literally beating. And verse 11 tells us, behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. You're Elijah, this is terrifying. A wind so powerful that it's splitting rocks into pieces. You're sheltered inside a rock. You know that if the rocks around you are torn, you're going to be crushed. And if you fall outside that doorway, you're going to drop hundreds of feet to your death with nothing to stop your fall until you meet the unforgiving rocks at the bottom where you will be torn into pieces. This must be the presence of the Lord in his mighty power. But verse 11 says, but the Lord was not in the wind. Hmm. Well, the wind passes and almost immediately the ground starts to quiver and tremble and shake. Rocks are falling past your observation window. They're tumbling and bouncing from cliff faces as they roll back down and crash at the bottom. The earthquake, it's, it's terrifying, but, but it's not surprising. I mean, the holy God of heaven is passing by. Why wouldn't the earthquake in fear at his very presence? This must be the shaking, earth-shaking presence of the Lord. But verse 11 ends by telling us, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Hmm. Well, the earth calms, and suddenly there's a smell of smoke, the sound of air being sucked in to fuel a flame. The cave gets hotter and hotter and starts to turn into an oven. The heat is almost unbearable. There's a fire. And of course there's a fire when God is nearby. The Bible says that God is an all-consuming fire. Elijah has just seen him send fire down from heaven to consume Mount Carmel's sacrifice. So here, this flame, this is the presence of the Lord. But verse 12 tells us the Lord was not in the fire. Hmm. Then the verse goes on and says, after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. Now that word whisper is important because it's not just a gentle breeze that's blowing by. The idea here is of a voice. The old King James translated it, this still, small voice. And that's beautiful. The ESV calls it here a low whisper. That's excellent too because the sound is barely audible, but this is not the sound of an unintelligible breeze. This is a voice, a voice with meaning. Let's pick it up in verse 13. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave and behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah, again? And Elijah said, again, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So Elijah wraps his face and trembling steps out to the entrance of the cave and the voice speaks to him asking the same question as before what are you doing here Elijah gives the same answer as before I'm here because out of the entire nation that is supposed to be yours I am the only one who still follows you it's all falling apart Lord and for everyone who thinks that Elijah is sinning here by being so spiritually low, here's God once again not scolding his discouraged child, not telling him to get over himself, but speaking to him with tender encouragement, listening to him, promising him it's not all over. It's not all over. In fact, God sends him on another mission. We're not going to get into the details of that mission right now, but I want you to see... Let's pick it up in verse 15, and we'll focus on the end as we wrap things up. 
And the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mehola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So God sends his servant on another mission. It's not all over, Elijah. And then he says, I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. <coughs> so what's God saying here on this mountaintop, in the middle of nowhere, to this servant who is captured by despair and depression? He's telling Elijah the true state of the world. And this is the message that God has for you and me today, Christian. May we hear it. He's saying, no matter what it looks like to your human eyes, no matter how desperate the situation is, no matter how hopeless or bleak the future seems to be, no matter how low your heart may be sunk within you, no matter what it looks like, I am on the throne and I am building my church. In fact, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell itself cannot prevail against it. And God says to Elijah, my power may not come in the fire sometimes, Sometimes it might, like on Carmel's Plateau, it did. People may accept that. They may reject that. My power isn't confined to the fire, and my power is not confined to an earthquake or a wind. In fact, most often, it'll come in the quiet, seeming futility of my word. How foolish. How foolish it sounds that a world could be transformed by people who read and proclaim and live this book. Are you kidding me? But God says, my word will not return to me void. Make no mistake, Elijah and Christian today, God's word is accomplishing everything he intends it to do. You need to hear this weary Christian. Because on this day when we honor fathers, some of you have examples of fathers that you lived under and they do anything but inspire confidence in you. Some of you grew up with fathers that paint an absolutely terrible picture of fatherhood. Love, that's a joke. Commitment, yeah, right. Somebody to be concerned about you when you're down? No way, give your head a shake, get over yourself. Life is full of disappointments. And so when you think of God as your heavenly father, you have a terrible view of what his fatherhood looks like. Some of you have the idea that God has no emotions for you. It's, it's his job to take care of you and, and then your job to give account when you die. You have a Muslim view of what God is like. You better not embarrass him. You better not let him down. Whatever you do, you better not show weakness or despair because that will insult him. And the God who spoke a universe into existence doesn't want to be insulted. If that's your view of God, friend, that's not the Christian view of God. And when you're in a spiritual state of, state of despair, if that's your idea of God, that'll only drive you deeper into the black. Well, the good news is the God of the Bible is so different. The God of Elijah, the one who feeds you when you're hungry. The one who listens when your heart is broken. It doesn't tell you to suck it up, but to draw close and hold on tighter. 
And the God who reveals himself and his presence in your state in exactly the manner you need him to be. And in the person of Jesus Christ, we see him revealed in, in all of these ways. God revealed himself as the God of fire when Jesus Christ took the wrath of God's fire on his own shoulders, the God's wrath against our sins. The earth quaked when Jesus died. And the Bible that says, if you sow the wind by your choices, you will reap the whirlwind. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, comes and endures the whirlwind that you and I sowed by our own foolish choices so that we could hear the gentle, soft, low breath of God's voice. Friend, Jesus Christ is building his church. He's building his kingdom. He's working out his good plan even when we can't see it. And his word may be quiet. It may seem to be doing nothing, but it has more effect than 10,000 of earthquakes. And he has promised to you also that no matter how alone you may feel trying to follow him in this world, God has promised, he has promised that he has reserved 7,000, and don't think that number is only literal, 7,000 servants of his besides you who arm in arm are walking with you in faithfulness to him who he is preserving and his work in this world therefore it will not fail and neither will his love for you so run to him if you're feeling down and discouraged run to him when you feel like you're at the end of the world and it's you against the world Run to him, and he will be there to hold you tight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the example of Elijah. Thank you that over and over in your word, you show us people who are real, who we can identify with, who are flesh as we are flesh, sometimes are weak and even fall into despair. Thank you for the example that we are not alone in that struggle we face. Thank you also for the example in your word of how you act towards your weary, broken servants. Your compassion to, to look after physical needs. Your compassion to listen and hear. And your compassion to be with and give your presence and your strength with the promise that your kingdom will advance, that we are not alone and we will never be alone. Lord, give us eyes to see that and to rest in you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.